So we've been working our way through the Lord's Prayer. It's been a couple of weeks since we've talked about it, but um, the Lord's Prayer is much more than, I think it's 57 words, a few words that we that we speak and we pray it every week. And I think it's wonderful that we do that. But if that's all we do about the Lord's Prayer, we're missing out on, on so much. Jesus said, pray in a manner like this. And I think he was trying to teach his disciples, and I'm sure they had more questions and more teaching about this that we don't have a record of. But the meaning behind the Lord's Prayer. And so the first week we looked at our Father who art in heaven. Who are we to pray to? We are to pray to God who is in heaven. And and actually heaven is everywhere that God is. I heard Tony Evans, uh, he was was preaching a sermon uh, this this past week. I heard him preach it. And uh, if you don't know Tony Evans, you need to get to know him and He's a powerful preacher in Dallas, Texas, and um, and he was talking about if you are a Christian, you will never be closer to hell than you are in this life. Interesting thought, because when we go to heaven, we go to a far, far better place than anything we can even imagine living in this world. And so the first step into heaven the first time when we die and we immediately go to be with with god we go to an amazing place and we will be in the presence of god and dwell there forever and ever and ever on the other hand if you so if you're a christian living in this world is the closest you ever be to to hell on the other hand if you are not a christian If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and sought to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never be closer to heaven than you are in this world. Think about that. Hell is going to be worse than anything we face here on this earth. Right now, we're living in that in-between time. A little bit of heaven... On earth, a little bit of hell, probably a little bit more of hell. Satan's the prince of darkness. He's the prince of this world, the father of lies. Uh, He's uh, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. For a limited time, that's what we face in this life, in this world. But Jesus Christ has overcome Satan. He's won the victory, and he will come back and gather all of his people and take them to that place he's prepared So anyway, we pray to our Father who is in heaven. And heaven is wherever God is. Hell is in the absence of God. Next week we talked about hallowed be thy name. God is the object of our worship. He's like no other. He commands our awe and our respect. And I think that's something that's gravely missing in our society and in our world today. The admiration of who God is. And so when we pray, we look to him, we pray to him, and we we pray that his name, that is like no other name, will be full of awe and respect that is rightfully due him. And then we talked about the names of God and each of the many different names of God. And I gave you a list of several of them listed in the Bible. But each of those names of God um, uh, describe a characteristic of God's nature and who he is. And then in week three, we we prayed, talked about thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. They were praying that heaven will come down to earth and as God's will is done in, in heaven, so will his will be done on earth. And the prayer is that God's will be done, not My will be done. And as we mature in our relationship with God, that's what happens. God's will is perfect and it doesn't need to change. However, our will is not perfect. It's full of sin and it does need to change. But as we mature in our faith, our will comes in line with God's will. And so full maturity is when our will and God's will 
are one and the same. Not as, even as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, God, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it was. And Jesus died on the cross for us. So we have here the focus in these first three petitions, these first three weeks. The focus is on God. Who he is. The focus is on worshiping him. Praising him for who he is. Acknowledging him for who he is. For God's will to be done on earth. Just like it is in heaven. Now today we move into a fourth position. Um, a petition, and it's different. Give us this day our daily bread. This petition signals a change. But the focus of the prayer continues to be on God and His will and His purpose and plan for our lives and our daily needs. Our daily bread speaks to the sovereignty of God. He is the one who provides it. And our assurance that we can depend upon God to meet our daily needs. But this is not a prayer about bread alone. It's about God's provision for all of our needs. And there's a wonderful quote from Martin Luther as he describes this. And he talked about, you know, it's, it's for, he described a bunch of different aspects of our lives that we're praying for in this prayer. Jesus himself, when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, and Satan tempted him, and, um, and he resisted Satan by quoting scripture. And he said, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. Not just bread, but what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, notice also in this uh, phrase, in this passage, there's a change in pronouns. Up to this point, it's been our father. How would be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The focus is upon God. But in this fourth petition... Jesus changes the pronouns. Give us this day our, our daily bread. But the focus is still on God. Notice that nowhere in this prayer is there a first person singular pronoun, I or me. You don't find it in the Lord's Prayer. Because we aren't to be self-centered, but rather God-centered and other-centered. The petition we're looking at today switches our focus from the sovereignty of God to that of the Lord meeting our daily needs. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're confessing our dependence upon God to meet our daily needs and in this world. When Jesus spoke of our daily bread, bread was symbolic of all of our needs. In biblical times, bread was a very staple of life. It was, it was something, it was baked fresh every day. They didn't have all the preservative, preservatives and stuff that we have in our bread. And every day, rich and poor, they baked their bread and ate their bread. But when we acknowledge him as our God, as our master provider, we acknowledge him as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We have three basic needs in life that we need God to provide for us. One is our physical needs, the shelter, the food, the, the clothing that we need. We all have emotional needs. Stability, confidence, hope, self-esteem. And we have spiritual needs. And these can only be satisfied through Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking closely at the words from this petition. And we're going to take the words one by one or small phrase to get a deeper meaning of how God provides for us. Point one is give. Give us 
It's only one word, but it's a very important word. The word give indicates our complete dependence upon God for everything. Everything we have, everything that we are is a gift from God. And God made us with needs so that we would have to look to him to supply them. It's an act of faith on us when we pray this prayer. And when we pray give, we are asking for God's help. We're putting our trust in God so that he can prov- provide for all of our needs. In fact, we're asking for freedom from worry. How often have we looked at an upcoming week or a time and said, how am I going to get through it? I think about as the kids are starting school and I think about college or seminary and, and you'd always get these syllabi from the, from the professors and you'd look at all the stuff that you had to do and I think, how in the world am I going to do all this stuff? And, and uh, have you ever had that thought? How am I going to get through this week? But you're admitting that you are work, when you do this, you're admitting you're working in your own power and you're not looking to God. Essentially, worry is an attempt to control the uncontrollable. And this is where Satan wants you to be. When you're focused on worry, you fail to realize that nothing is impossible with God. James 2 says, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have Because you do not ask God. Isn't that so common what is going on in our world today? God wants us to look to him in all things. When we don't know what to do, he is a source of wisdom. That's why we need to study and understand and obey the Bible, which is God's primary source of revelation to us. When we feel like everything is caving in on us, He is our source of encouragement. When we run out of energy, he is our source of strength. When things look hopeless, he is our source of hope. When we're stressed, he is our source of peace. When we are irritated, he is our source of patience. When we are overwhelmed with guilt, he is our source of salvation. God has given us a wonderful promise. Philippians 4, 19 and 20 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. To pray give is not a demanding or commanding prayer. It is an acknowledgement that there is nothing that the sovereign God can't do for us if we will ask him. Point two, the word us, give us. It's important to remember that this is not a selfish prayer. It's not give me this day, give us this day. And Jesus is telling us that we should pray for the needs of others. In Matthew 25, he gives this parable. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came and visited me. If you remember this parable, you also remember that they are surprised by the king. They were so busy doing that they didn't consider why they were doing it. It was just something they had to do. When we pray for others, we are recognizing God's sovereignty as does um, as our father. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The selfless act of praying for others is a natural outcome. 
Point three, this day. Give us this day. And it reminds us not to get ahead of ourselves. It reminds us that our Christian walk is a daily walk. And we need a daily reminder of his strength and patience. When we live in the past, we usually think things like, oh, if only it could be that way again. You ever had some of those thoughts? Oh, I wish we could go back to the good old days. But usually when we do that, we live in sadness, don't we? Or sometimes we live in the future. A great deal of the time when we think about the future, we're living in worry, aren't we? What's going to happen tomorrow? I don't understand this world we're living in. I don't know what we're going to do about tomorrow. I don't know if I can provide for my needs in the future. But Jesus wants to teach us to live in the present. In Matthew 6, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, we're going to face trials and tribulations in this life and world. But this portion of the prayer is not a command, but it's a promise that the need we have this day will be met this day. Philippians 4, 19 and 20 says, and again, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then we pray for our daily bread. The invitation to pray, give us this day our daily bread, is not an invitation to pray for anything that we want. Oh God, I pray for a Mercedes Benz. Oh God, give me a BMW. It's not like some of these name it, claim it preachers that you, that you see. You know, your best life now. I'm sorry to tell you, but this is not the best life. The best life is yet to come. And God isn't here just to grant your every wish like a genie in the sky. But he is here to give us the necessities that we need in life. And bread was a staple in Jesus' time. It was a main source of food, and it was affordable to all families. This part of the, of the prayer is a petition to of asking God and having the confidence that God will meet the true daily needs that we have. Consider God's provision for the people in Israel. Think about when they left Egypt. You know, God miraculously worked to make that happen. And so you had, scholars say, over a million people. They escaped, and, and they were given a bunch of stuff when they left, they didn't leave empty-handed. They had all kinds of stuff that the Egyptians said, just get out of here. I want you out. But you've got a million people, and you think of Moses. Okay, how am I going to feed these people? Think of how many sheep, how many, uh, just everything it would take to feed and care for over a million people. But what happened? God provided for their, for their meals. Bread came down from heaven. Every day, what happened if you, had, if you would gather a little bit? Well, maybe God's not going to do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll just gather a little bit more uh, than I need for tomorrow. What happened? It would rot. It would spoil. Probably stunk. Um, except for one day on the Sabbath. Because they weren't to do any work on the Sabbath. And so God, they were to gather up two days full of, of manna. For that day. But God provided not only bread. Not only food for them. He fed them but he gave them water. To drink. Water for a million people. That's a lot of water. You think of all the bottled water that would, that would take. But God provided for them. You know what else? Their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out. Now imagine there were probably some ladies. And some people that. that, that you know 40 years. I've <laughs> been wearing this coat. 
uh, this, this sweater, this, uh, this robe. I'm tired. I want a different color. But, but um, it never wore out. God provided for them in the wilderness. And as they were called to remember that, and so um, when they, uh, God told them when they prepared the Ark of the Covenant that had this special stuff in it to remember the way God had worked for them in the past, to help them to look forward into the future, God told them to gather some manna and put in that Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies. And you know what? That bread, that manna didn't spoil But God wanted them to remember that he's a God who provides for their needs. Jesus recognized the daily needs of the people. You know, he was having this great lecture series and and people came out and there weren't any McDonald's or or, uh, um, other restaurants around. And he'd been teaching all day. Everybody was hungry. There were at least 5,000 men, so probably 15,000 people or so. And they were all hungry. And disciples said, you know, maybe we ought to send them home, let them get something to eat, come back another day. And Jesus said, no, you give them something to eat. You have a part in this. And what happened? One little boy whose mama fixed him a couple of fish sandwiches, a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. He said, you know, I don't have much, can't feed all the people, but Jesus, I give you what I have. And what did Jesus do? When you give it to Jesus, he supplied all their needs and they ate all they wanted. And then they had some left over. That's the kind of God that we serve who gives us our daily bread. So when we pray our daily bread, we realize two things. God provides what we really need, not always what we want or what we think we need and also God provides it when we need it the most now there's some 5.5 or principles for receiving God's provision one is obedience many of the prayers in the Bible are conditional promises that we have to do something and one God calls us to be obedient we must be obedient in our walk with Christ And in John 15, Jesus said, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If we're Christians, there ought to be evidence that we are Christians by the way we live our lives and care for one another. We must also be thinking about other people. Hebrews 10 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We're to encourage one another to do good things, to love one another. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, we live in a world where there's, you know, the... People don't attend church quite the way they used to, not as consistently and and um, just not as much as as they used to. We say, and and this is prophesied in Scripture. It's going to happen. There will be a a turning away from God. But it doesn't mean we ought to give up. We need to continue encouraging. We need to continue to gather and worship, corporate worship of the people. And we're to live our lives in relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, sharing love uh, with one another. And then there's faith. Hebrews 11 says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We must believe that God will provide and that we we may not know how, we don't need to know how, but God will. So in conclusion, when we pray this prayer in seriousness, wonderful things can happen to us and we will be transformed. We'll be transformed from fear to confidence. We will learn that God will meet our daily needs. We'll be transformed from grumbling to gratitude. We will stop focusing on our need and be grateful to God who meets our needs. 
will be transformed from troubled to trusting. We will live in, with the realization that God will meet our daily needs and trust him to do so. So let us boldly and frequently pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Oh.